I know now why I didn't bring the book yesterday. <laughs> I don't ever want to do anything out of the timing. <laughs> so true. Uh, this is Walter Langan's book. It is wonderful. And it is. Everything is wonderful. Yeah. But I read this several years ago and I picked it up again last week. And it was a brand new book. I never heard it before. <laughs> Not like I'm hearing it now. <coughs> words. Yep. When I read it before, I read the words of a man. But when I'm reading it now, I am receiving the vibration <laughs> of the essence of the emanation of he who exists, yes, speaking yes. personally, intimately, into the depths of me. And I just want y'all to receive it like that for you this morning. It may take about five minutes, if that's okay. Every word is a living word. Amen. <laughs> Thou art the bright messenger, the shining one, the being of pure spirit. Thou art not the man thou wast below these years. Thou art born anew, fresh, clean, and pure. Now this is not speaking to your John Smith man. This is speaking to your higher self, your God self. This is who you really are. This is the mystery, the revealing the mysteries. This is the deepest mystery that we know who and what we are. <coughs> so just open yourself and let your inner man just drink of this. Thou art not an old creature patched up by various treatments. Thou, bright messenger, golden one, hast never descended into the level of belief and therefore has not consorted with the shadows of the play we call life. Excuse me. Thou art the bright messenger with winged feet who goeth where he will and knoweth not obstruction nor condition. Thou art the unconditioned, the untrammeled, the free, the individualized, yet inseparable manifestation of the all God. That's who we are. Thou art the bright messenger. Thou art full of light, bathed in all light, Whithersoever thou goest is light, not consciously projected, but unconsciously conveyed Amen. a natural effect <laughs> of thy presence. Amen. Yeah. Ooh. Yes. Thou art the bright messenger. Thine eye is single to the allness of God, the oneness of creation. Thou therefore seest with the eye of light. Thou lookest into a universe of all light and sees through the shadows of belief. Thou seest the world in a world. Thou seest a rose in the rose and the man in a man. Thou perceivest with thy eye of light to that which is and always has been. Not that which shall be changed by begging beseeching or praying to a tyrant called God to make whole, but with the eye of light thou seest nothing to heal, for thy sight is perfect in understanding. Such as thou hast in the touch, O bright messenger, is beyond the price of pearls and rubies transforming touch which is gentle yet firm, which is soft like the surface of the ocean but has the power to dash a whole fleet of evil, of evil ships into oblivion. Thou art the bright messenger. Thy touch is golden. 
Thou art the bright messenger. The aroma of thy presence precedes thee. Mm. Thy passing is as the passing of a cloud of incense from the sacred lilies of the enchanted woods. In thy presence, the per precious perfume of the soul is sensed above the stagnant odors of human beliefs. When thou comest to the soul, it is as the bridegroom cometh, whom the lovely flowers of purity open and shed their perfume and <coughs> super abundance. At thy coming, the rose loosens the silken tassel of her soul and gives forth the glorious fragrance of her being. At thy coming, the trees and minerals loosen the glorious, refreshing odors of woods and stones. From thy nostrils comes the breath of life. From thy breath comes the appearance of a new creation. Man becomes a living soul by breathing thy breath. Man lives and moves and breathes and has his being in thy breath. Thy breath fans the small sparks of faith into the flame of realization. From thy nostrils comes the flashy, dazzling fire which consumes the dross of belief. Thou art the bright messenger. Thy invitation is, oh, taste and see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That the Lord is good. Amen. Eat from my body, my substance, and drink from my blood, inspiration. Thy taste is golden. The milk and honey of the universe of the all God are thine. The hidden manna, that which the eye, the human belief, cannot see, feedest thou upon. The eternal drink of living water, thou shalt never be without the substance of spirit, no matter where thou goest. Thou shalt realize this all substance and shall cease from thy thought-taking process of wondering wherewithal shall we be clothed and fed. Thou shalt eat and hunger no more. Thou shalt drink and thirst no more, for thou shalt feed upon the reality of life instead of the husk of material belief Amen. with its shadow appearances. Thou art the bright messenger the bearer of glad tidings, upon thy breastplate is encrusted in gold this motto, speak no evil nor listen to. Thou art of too pure ears to hear evil. Thou hearest with the ear of spirit. Thou hearest with the silver ear, closed to the din of the human relative conditions but open to that which eye has not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into, the, into man or human thought, the things which are prepared for them that love thy truth. Thou hearest the word of peace, and a whole ocean of fury, of belief, ceaseth, still and may calm. Thou hearest the reports of that which says, of which is, and thou tellest of these. Thou hearest the things that ear hath not heard, the ear of man, because uh, whose breath is in his nostrils, and whose eye is double, and yet thou hearest the report of the kingdom here and now. Thou hearest the glad tidings of the eternal Christ, walking today in the garden of attainment. Thou hearest the words, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And thou recognize these words as addressed to thee. Amen. Amen. 
Thou art not ashamed or afraid because of thy nakedness. The stark tragedies of the human belief fade into the distance when thou answerest this call with yes, yes of spirit. Thou hearest the truest sense of the word. In the fearless sense of the word, arise and shine. For thy light is come. No need to create that light, to stimulate it, but only to recognize that the light is already in you. Thou art the bright messenger the being of light, the unafraid. Why should thou be afraid when the realization has come that thou art the bright messenger, the being of pure light, not subject to the beliefs of the thought world, not subject to the failures and successes of our human life, but suddenly up and above that which has always seemed so real. Bright messenger, unafraid being, holy creature, son of God, arise, arise and shine. Let thy light so shine. Take no thought. If thou take thought, it will be a fear and limitation. Amen. Thou art the bright messenger, the being of light that goeth before the manifestation of thy human self and maketh straight the way. Thou art the unafraid, the unbound, the Prometheus unbound. And Prometheus is, a, is from Greek mythology. He was known for his intelligence. He was like a hero to mankind. And he's the one that the mythology says brought fire to earth to man. Thou art, thou shalt smite the rock and make it gush forth with the living water of life. Thou art the bright messenger, the being of light, the unafraid. From the standpoint of assumption, I'm sorry, I skipped two pages. Thou art glorious, thou art free, thou art not bound by human limitations. Thou art not another, a separate one, but the same one. Amen. Thou Amen. art the Christ. Yes. Amen. Hail, soul of me. I salute you, Son of God, Christ, bright messenger, and thou recognize it, that these words are addressed to thee. Amen. 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 Wow. Yeah, I worked uh, <laughs> two years on this project, and uh, I'm going to let it flow, but... Uh, once I get to rolling, y'all, I don't want to take the whole time because I'm working on stuff that I need Lynn's input. So after I feel a certain release, I'm going to shut it down and give it to Lynn. I don't know how the schedule is. I have enough material to do the whole weekend, but my point is this is a collaboration. There's a plenty of material for you to get of Lynn, and, and I've enjoyed it over the years. You can get my material, but this is a collaboration of all of us. Yes. And so I'm honored that I'm being able to do this. And so I told him I want to make sure I do this because by the time I eat and waterworks come on, this shirt ain't going to be. So the stick man is the out-of-the-box theology. And so let me say up front that uh, I have about two or three people, actually about four, that I go to for resources uh, one was Dr. Craig Lyons, who is not able to, well, he's in hospice somewhere. Uh, I'll explain that in porch ministry later. But uh, he, I was around him for a number of years, and then he had a brain bleed. Uh, Lynn Hayes and the stick man, I would not be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for you. Uh, and I did get blessed that Alan Newton is here, and Alan and I have shared a lot of email discussions. He has really helped me see the vibration of the verbs of Hebrew, uh, Carl Armstrong, Jim Thomas. But this whole thing that I'm about to share came from a series of dreams. And I'm not going to share the dreams. I don't mind sharing dreams. But I get off on dreams. I don't get any of the material shared. 
So I had to do about three consecutive dreams. But these charts would not happen if it wasn't for Mark and Cindy Bates because he said, you're trying to cram 20 years of research. Can you do a chart or something to kind of explain some of this? And so I went to Kathy, and we're just thinking of a chart, maybe, you know, one little bitty chart. Well, that turned into about 10 of them, and she has put to work. She is resting this morning. Uh, we have been on the road for the last two years, weeks. I have been in Peru, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, and then we come here. And I drive a trash truck for a living. After I drive so much, I go to sleep. So my wife has been driving and taking care of me. And so let me get on with this. Uh, the last time that we were in Dalton, we were working on what I call the Bible Acrostics. This is the book that I have co-authored with Carl Armstrong. A uh, little detail there. I was sharing with him a message uh, in Passover of 2016. And uh, I was sharing some revelation with him, and he looked at me like, just that look that, what in the world, this guy's crazy. So I never expected to hear from Carl again, but I gave him links of Calm 1 and 2, because I knew that he had greatly blessed many of the people that have met. In fact, there's a woman named Karen who had Oklahoma, and she introduced me to Alvin Boyd Coon. She also introduced me to Dr. Craig Lyons, and she also introduced me to Carl Armstrong, to his writings, but I never met him. And so I went into a meeting. I got to introduce her to Lynn and his CDs. And so I met, I met Carl, and I gave him a lesson. We come home, and he said, you know, I'm a chemist. I'm a chemical engineer. He said, your Hebrew looks like chemistry. And he saw something in the Hebrew. He said, what do you know about acrostics? I said, all I know is a lot of people don't talk about it. And so we started studying the chemistry of the Hebrew alphabet. That's my title today. Because whether or not you realize this, and you said this years ago, this Hebrew is more of a science than it ever has been a religion. Amen. And so we started working together. This book came out about two weeks. Now here's the, here's the bittersweet part. This book was published two days after my mom had passed. And so I'm having publishing at the same time I'm having this. How many of y'all know there's a lot of breakthrough and chaos at the same time? Yeah. You got breakthrough and breakdown at the same time. And I got all kinds of emotions. And so this book come out. Uh, a lot of the material in it is not the full material, but it was enough to get an introduction. And I began to share some things with Carl. We have worked since then for the last two years. And he has a brand new book come out called The Doorknob, Exploring the Doorway to Christian Physics, Chemistry, and Biology. Both of those are back there. And... Uh, See my wife, and she tells you all about that. But, so after Mark Bates asked me, ooh, this thing is, he's trying to, the glyphs are drawing it to it. I might have thumped it. There we go. So here is the thing that has, been such a blessing. I got this and I started writing this down, but it took my wife to take and laminate these and put could, these together. So, this is called the Eaton Integrated Ancient Hebrew, and these charts were supposed to be ready for this book, but I just got about halfway through it and I said, okay, whatever, and I just let it go. And so, my wife comes in there one day and she sits there at the computer and she says, So, tell me as brief as you can. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see Hebrew? And of course, there is no e integrated ancient Hebrew uh, without the people that I'm talking about. That's why I wanted to make sure I had this shirt on, because it is stickman theology. In order to think out of the box, you have to think like there's no box. And this certainly is a part of this. this is, I call this the creative energy of the glyphs. Now, my research has took me all the way back to what is known as a book that is called Black Genesis. Now that's not a race thing. I mean, I know this is a grace, not a race thing. And Black Genesis has to do with the fact that the people that was in the Sahara Desert that predates ancient Egypt. And out of this is what is called a group of people called the Kemetans. Now I have met a few Kemetans. I actually met a, had a conversation with a cop who is a actual, he creates Kemetan jewelry. He was on YouTube. And I called one day, and, and I just left a message, and he called my house back. And we talked for about two or three hours, and he said he grew up in the Assembly of God, Church of God. 
And when he was younger, he would go to his dad, who was a minister. And he said, let me ask you something. How come we only hear about one son of Noah? No one ever talks about the other half of the world. And so he went to ancient Egypt, and when he went into the pyramids, he read an actual verse that appeared in the Bible, and it began his journey. He was an awesome man. He actually went and greeted the mailman while we talked. He was a real cool guy, and he was full of information. But what did, blew me away is while he's unloading all this about ancient Egypt, he wanted to know about ancient Hebrew. And so we had an awesome conversation. I plan on picking that research up. But that is going to be on this chart as Black Genesis and Kemet and Ancient Egypt. Out of these two, this man by the name of William Jones, who was a linguistic, actually said that the source of all ancient languages is 3-3. And I disagree with him, but this is what linguistics say. You have Arabic, then you have Sanskrit, And then you have Chinese, and all of these are like building blocks to ancient Egypt. And that's what our, our linguistics have told us for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so that was the, the kind of the philosophy I was taught. And so then I looked at this chart, and I began to study this, and I said, well, okay. Two weeks after this was done, my good friend Mike Clegg called me, and he said, hey, I have found a book that you need to get your hands on and it's a book called The Tree of Life it's a Kabbalistic book by name F.J. Myers and when I read the definitions what blew me away is it was the same definitions that they told me was Aramaic and a yellow, little yellow book called Arthur B. Ingalls he was actually a companion of Joe Goldsmith he said Mark I think this is what you've been looking for two weeks after this book was published and so I looked it up, and he said he studied under a guy named Anton, Anton Fabri de Olivet. I had never heard that name. I looked it up on Wikipedia. Yes, I did. I hammer on Wikipedia, but I looked it up. <laughs> and I looked, and this book was called The Hebrew Tongue Restored and the True Meaning of Hebrew Words Reestablished and Proved by the Radical Analysis, Volume 1 and 2. This is an English print. And by the way, there was only 500 of these ever put in English print. All the rest of them were in French. Now what blew me away is that my <coughs> wife has been studying for about uh, maybe the last two or three years a man by the name of William Kingsland. In fact, we found the book at half price and Dr. Craig Lyons told me about it. And I remember reading this book and I saw at the bottom of the book a French book, the name of it, and I knew from what it was about Hebrew, and I said to myself, in the middle of the summer, I said, God, I would love to have my hands on this book, but it's in French. I knew that there was something within me that William Kingsland, who was a companion of Alvin Boncoon, said, this book absolutely radically changed the way he saw the book of Genesis. And that was six months in the day till Mike Clegg and I ordered this book and it came. And the first thing he says is, I disagree with William Jones. This is not Arabic. This is Hebrew. And these three languages is your road to ancient Egypt. Yes. You know how old this book is? This book, the copyright... I'm having fun up here, by the way. <laughs> What's the, the, name the, book? the name of the book is The Hebrew Tongue Restored of the True Meanings of Hebrew Reestablished and Proved by Radical Analysis. The edition of the Hebrew Tongue is printed and typed to 500 copies, and it's a complete reprint. This book, was the publisher, was done in 1921. But this book, and I've done the research on it, came... At the end, it came in the 1800s, and he has a complete, absolutely, translation of the first three chapters of Genesis at the end of this book. And he absolutely says that it is nothing more than us understanding Egyptian. Now, his name again? His name is Faber D. Olivet. Actually, let me write his name. I'm going to pass this around, and you're going to be able to uh, look at it. 
but his full name is not on the sheet. So this is this guy's name, and let me tell you. Now, it would be interesting if that's the only thing that happened. But then the next week, Carl Armstrong sends me a thing about a chemist that actually created the fire extinguisher. And guess what he got his hands on and decided to be a linguistics at the end of his life? Fabre de Olivet. <laughs> People started sending me stuff on this guy and didn't know what I was studying. They didn't know I had the original. And we began to study this, and when I opened this up, I said, this sounds just like Dr. Robert Young, including the fact that he tells you that the Hebrew grammar people absolutely, positively changed Hebrew grammar to make God into a tyrant. This book will be babysitted by none other than Lynn Hayes this weekend. <laughs> so, I started putting the chart together. So then I went over to Sumerian in this thing called Paleo Hebrew. A man by the name of Frank Seekins, and he is the one behind Red Blood Moons. He actually took Hebrew and went into the Chinese language and he began to create a pictographic Hebrew. And he actually says, it documents that he did this and from this guy who spent about, I'm going to put his name up here. His name is actually Frank Seekins. He is the scholar behind the Red Bullet Moons of Mark Blintz. He spent 30 years in polio and there's this guy, which I ran into Dr. Jeff Benner two months after listening to Lynn Hayes' tapes and thought that, I said, this guy is just like me. We both crazy. But he has only been involved in it in the last maybe 20 years. I met him in 19, in 2010. I went to a conference with a lady who studied under him. Both of them doing polio Hebrew. Well, at the same time, I'm surrounded by Carlos Suarez, the cipher of Genesis, and Dr. Roy Blizzard, which I have really drawn a lot of resources from both of those scholars, and I know that Lynn cut his teeth on Roy Blizzard, and so did Dr. Craig Lyons. Well, then I decided to study H.P. Bavasky, and she always talked about the book of Dizan and the Chinese language and its connection to Sanskrit, as well as Alvin Boyd Kuhn. So I started putting these together and I said, okay, if I'm going to really see the Hebrew language, I've got to integrate all of this. So I'm going to pass this around. I'll just, I'll get done, give it back to Lynn. And then I began to think about, okay, we have three things here. We have Hebrew, Aramaic script, Kabbalah, Paleo Hebrew, and what we would know as modern day Hebrew. And I started seeing these as a rotation. Now, these came in dreams. I didn't get this out of a theological institution. I got this in dreams. I said, man, I tried dominoes. Amen. I tried I tried pizza. I still have these crazy dreams. <laughs> and, and this started because a woman came to me and talked to me about books I had wrote, and she was arguing about what was in the books, and I had never wrote the book. And this was the material that was in the book. So I began to see that, okay, if I'm going to do this, I've got to integrate all of these right here, which was five different things. Now here's going to be really the crazy one. So there were these movements. Talk about roots, Benji. This has been my roots right here. These five movements. The Theosophical Society, H.P. Babowski. Edinburgh Hebrew, Dr. Robert Young. My, I've always been around people who did Aramaic and tried to get me to do Aramaic, and I said no. Syriac, and then I realized that H.P. G.H. Pember, who wrote Earth's Earliest Age, I went back and found a copy of it, a PDF file, and you know what the subtitle of that book is? The subtitle of that book is A Response to the Theosophical Society. Now, they dropped that title now, but G.H. Pember was trying to Christianize the Theosophical Society. I'll also tell you this, A.W. Pink was a part of the Theosophical Society and left it. I'll give you even more than that. This guy right here 
I have went back, and Farway de Olivet is never mentioned up until William Kingsland. And when he would mention this, he would say, I'm going to prove to you that this was one of the resources that predated 19, 1850. Now, not 1850, the early 1900s, they, like 1870-something, this book predated it. I believe this is 1823. I got a lot of stuff going through my head down now, but we can verify it's an 18-something. And William Kingsland brought this book to the Theosophical Society. He has two books here. One other book he wrote on Pythagoras. Now, I'm going to really freak you out. But when I was in Charismania, a monk appeared in my home. And I don't know why he was in a monk outfit, but when I was standing there, he stood right there. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to make sure you uncover all the stuff you're supposed to uncover. And I have had this research for two years, and two months ago, I opened this book only to have chills because there's a picture of Faber de Olivet, and he was the monk in the monk's outfit. Now, he was not a monk. I don't understand that yet, except for in my brain, my charismatic brain, Oriental is what I think of monk. For some reason, I always think of being so Oriental that there's a picture of this guy. I said, woo, I got Jesus bumps over that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is William Kingsland. This is this. This is the golden verses of Pythagoras. Y'all can come take a look at them after Lynn gets done. So these are all connected because Edinburgh Hebrew, Dr. Robert Young, was trying to give a biblical exploration of what was discovered in the Theosophical Society and being discovered in what was known as Chaldean. I ain't got there yet. So then, while I'm reading this book, y'all gonna make it. I'll be, I'll be passing this out to ushers if we ain't gonna be hanging out to people outside. What are you doing? Then there's this book, The Peopling of the Earth, by Jeffrey Baboka. And this book was written about the Theosophical Movement. And these were in a warehouse, and Karen from Oklahoma bought a whole slew of these and there was one sent back, and we got our hands, and the guy said, hey, wait a minute, why is all you people from Georgia, uh, Texas, and Oklahoma, y'all emptying out these warehouses? This stuff's been here for 10 years. He said, what's going on over there? I said, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> but in this book, we have a place, a chapter called, uh, where did these people come from? No, I'm sorry. The Immortal Wisdom. And in this book, it explains the three main sources. And I read this book word for word. Actually, me and Mark Bates went through this. And the three sources is Trans-Himalayan, which is Chaldean-Tibetan, Aryan chalio and Tibetan, the Vedas, Aryans, the Law of Menu, the Kabbalah, and listen to this distinction. Mosaic Hebrew, which refers to the Bible and the Chaldean Book of Moses and the Kabbalah. And I started taking these sources here and going back to and comparing them to Fabri de Olivet. Now let me tell you. Here's the question. If the Dead Sea Scrolls was not discovered until 1947, and that's the Research where they get polio, Frank Sickens and Jeff Benner. How in the world did Olivet know about it? And he predates 1850. They said he wrote a whole lot of stuff. Now, the story is, is F.B. Myers was the janitor for the Queen of England. So they let him have access to a lot of Hebrew in England. And he wrote a book on the Kabbalah. You can only get it online and download it. But he studied under Olivet. Olivet was French, but had to leave the French Revolution and go and study under rabbis both in Germany and England because of what was going on in French. And then when he came back, wrote a ton of stuff. And they, the fire burned most of the books except for maybe two or three. And the thing that's even wilder than that is he was considered a Paris Kabbalist. How many other Paris Kabbalists do you know named Carlos Suarez? So these links, although I can't fully connect them, tells us that there is a library 
that is available that predates 18-something that will blow away the Hebrew that we're just now finding, although they are talking about, and they say at the end of the book it's discredited, called the Lost Book of Moses, that there are other books in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's a, it's a, they say it's a myth, but they say it's not really true. I think there's a whole lot of manuscripts we don't have access to, and they have access to them, but we have an American Catholicism that don't want nothing to do, and it's buried in the archives all over this planet. And this is taken from the book, The Peopling of the Earth, which will be right here. So what I did is I started combining ancient Egypt, Kabbalah, Edinburgh Hebrew to a Paleo-Hebrew script. And I started looking at these languages, and what I started realizing is I thought I was looking at something to make me understand the Bible. But what it did is it made me start getting a code to decipher every language of the world because these guys did not look at one particular language. And here's our problem. We want to take one language and make it the cure-all for everything. These guys went into these ancient texts and they have a whole bunch of stuff they <coughs> reference that we have no idea about. But for whatever reason, because of the movement that's going on right now, and we're in this crossover, tons of this information is starting to be made available. So, let me throw this at you. Mainly the Theosophical Society became very interested in Sanskrit. And there is a report that they came and said, let me ask you who the person is that taught the Sanskrit. And I was blown away when I found out that they didn't tell them to go to India. They told them to go to Hawaii and study under the ancient mystic of the Hunas. In fact, there's actually a part of Olivet in the English copy that says it is the property of the Hawaiian, the, the, the college library of Hawaii, University of Hawaii. So what is Hawaii? I don't know. But the language of Huna, the mystical language, goes back to, it is like Greek and how it's put together, but it's derivative from ancient he Egyptian glyphs. I don't know about you, but that's exciting. So you have what's called Aryan Sanskrit, which was the culmination of the last thing I showed you. She combined all those to create a decipher in order to see all of these languages in those materials I just said. And I have other books that I did not bring that is the prop my wife owns them, and they talk about these mystic, and they said she owned the rarest mystical library that has ever been in existence. And out of this library, I learned that William Jones, the guy I mentioned earlier, said that Sanskrit, <coughs> I learned this eh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 years ago, that Sanskrit is also the root language, Indo-European roots, of Latin, Classical Greek, New Testament Greek, Modern Greek, and the language of the mystical language of the Hawaiians, which is Hunan. Now, what happened is, and I'll be honest with you, the Theosophical Movement <coughs> became more emphasis on India and Sanskrit, particularly because a guy named T. Subba wrote. But when William Kingsland and Alvin Boyd come, on, come along, they began to balance it and began to talk about ancient Egypt as well as ancient India. And by the time you come into later, there was a lot of Kabbalists who were never even allowed a part of that society because there was so much material on Hebrew that was damaging. But when you go back to these ancient books, dude, this sounds just like Robert Young. This is the stuff that I was looking for a Dr. Robert Young almost 10 to 20 years ago. I mean, there's things that reads, that, that reads just like, including in the beginning of the Youngs, where he says the Hebrew grammar people changed a lot of the Hebrew grammar so that it would talk about God in the past tense, not the God who is present and living now. Cool. So here's the question. The Paleo-Hebrew discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls birthed what was known of as Palestinian Aramaic. Joseph Fritz Meyer, I said this last night, told them in the 1940s, hey, don't have nothing to do with Syriac or Chaldean, have to do with the Palestinian. And the Palestinian Aramaic, whether you know it or not, is split into Eastern and Western Aramaic, and then they have this older script. And let me tell you, whole theological wars go on between Eastern and Western Aramaic, and in order to translate it, you've got to know both sides. 
So I'm sitting there one day, working on this in my head. This doesn't give you a headache. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He, he, you know what? If you don't understand guys like Joe Goldsmith and those stuff you're reading, if you don't understand this is the divine you, it's the greatest thing in the world. But if you try to make this into a doctrine, because the belief is your brain cannot hold the library that's available to us that we don't even check out. Because when you step into this energy, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, your whole house changes. Library starts showing up. You know, you got monk showing up. How are you doing? <laughs> Ain't seen you in here. So, DNA. when I looked at this, here's what I was looking at. You got the Hebrew, you got the Greek. And, I, and, and, you know, when I'm in Greek thought, everything was Greek. When I was in Hebrew, everything's Hebrew. And I'm sitting here asking myself, what's Aramaic? And that's when it hit me. Aramaic, not Chaldean, Aramaic is where the Eastern and Western world begin to harmonize. Aramaic is not a replacement to Hebrew and Greek. It's a bridge. And, man, when I saw that, I said, man, you talk about pulling the Hebrew root to the Greek words. Because now we've got an Aramaic bridge to ancient Hebrew. And listen, everything you see in Aramaic will only amplify the Hebrew. It took me right back into the Hebrew. Now I'm going to do a little more and then I'm going to pause for later. But I started looking at this right here. Now look at these three languages. These are the core languages of the world. Hebrew, Sanskrit. I begin to read guys like Godfrey Higgins that begin to question even the fact that possibly what we know of as ancient Israel was the ancient Brahmis of ancient India. There are two people who wrote books and papers on this linguistically. One got killed, one left the country, and they can't find either one. You do not go into ancient India and say, oh, by the way, you really don't know your history. But I am convinced through archaeology that ancient Hebrew and Sanskrit came from one source. Just as I am convinced you have ancient Egypt, Gerald Massey, I used to talk to Craig Lyons and he would do this thing where he would sit down in a chair and I said, Craig, what are you doing? And he'd say, I'm Gerald Massey, I'm looking at the hieroglyphs. And it was like he would become that person. And he would start preaching. We was at Starbucks one day and he did this. And he'd be crying, snotting, shouting. We're sitting there and say, hey man, what, so what do you think of Jesus? Oh, let me sit. <laughs> Gerald Massey was doing the edge. And all of a sudden, wow, dude. I said, oh my gosh, these people think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but that was him. He was very animated. <clears throat> and then at the very end, he would just break. And he'd say, why? Why was I given this opportunity. He said, I have three degrees from Southwest Theological. He said, and they lied to me about every bit of this. That's why. Because he would know. So then you have the Aryan Tibetan, which is the Chaldean Tibetan, Jeffrey Balbaka, Vons Houston, the number one authority of Sanskrit in the world. I remember when I got into yoga, they told me the only word for Sanskrit was breath. And I, I looked up, he lives in Houston, and when Vaughn Houston came out, there's a word for spirit, there's a word for soul. Listen, Sanskrit is a very detailed language, just like Hebrew, and we've been told lies because they're selling us a westernized Sanskrit that isn't like the original, and this east-west battle is part of what split the Theosophical Society. But we have Aramaic, not as a language to replace it, but as a language in order to bridge it. And oh, am I having fun now. It's like the counterforms. Yes, the cuneiform tablets. Yeah. And then you have the Hebrew Egyptian, that creates part of Hebrew, ancient script, Aramaic, and Chaldean. I did not know the difference between these two, but I made two or three phone calls, and they didn't like me. So I said, there got to be something there. And it's <laughs> to, to the Greek. Listen, we have the ability. We have the ability to take any particular glyph and break this through and pull those ancient Egyptian Paleo-Hebrew 
through the Aramaic, the Chaldean, to get to the fact that we have now all of this Greek, and listen, whether you realize it or not, all of this Greek stuff was just a collaboration of all of the, it was a mythology of all the ancient myths. Or, let, let me rephrase it, all the ancient truths that they turned into mythology, and when you go into the Greek language, you can find every language in the world. Alexander Great did that. And no, so I look at my... He was kicked out of India, remember? He went over there, he thought he was going to take over India. Um, and, uh, but then he went over there and saw some truth, and he said, oh, I'll catch you later, and he ducked out of the country when he saw the truth that they buried there. There was so much material. William Jones not only was a part of Edward Budge and Gerald Massey to excavate Egypt, he was a part of a group that would excavate India. And you know who was a part of their society and knows Sanskrit, Greek, and that? Farafin. That's why there's things called an Orientalist in Hebrew that I used to read in the Farafin, and I'd say, what was an Orientalist? I know a lot more now, but back then, that drove me crazy. Because I was a word of faith, charismatic Kenneth Copeland looking for Oriental Hebrew. <laughs> we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I have to show these presentations, and I'm going to actually stop after this one because this gets you into Aramaic. But here's, and I'm going to pass this one, but I'll start with this one next. George Lamsa. Here's what happened. George Lamsa was born in a part of the Assyria that had never been contaminated by the Western world. And so he brought a manuscript, and he actually took theology in Virginia. And while he was there, Joseph Fritzmeier said, don't have nothing to do with the Chaldean and the Assyrian. You know? Well, most people, you point at their finger... They're not looking at what you're pointing at. They're looking at the end of your finger. But Dr. Gene Scott said, who are you to tell me I can't look back there? So he went and found Lamsa, and he was, one of the found, he was the founder of the theological Oral Roberts University. And so Oral did things financially, and then he withdrew and went to California. He also was a professor somewhere else. But you have George Lamsa, and from Lamsa came Rocco Erico. Many of you have read his stuff in Science and Mind. He says something beautiful, and I just want to do a few glyphs here, but he says something beautiful about this word. The Aramaic word for prayer is the word sofla. And I'm probably butchering the pronunciation like I do any other word. But this <coughs> word means to tune to a frequency. Prayer isn't begging God, it's tuning to the frequency within your life that is in you, that's increasing from the, the, the epiphanies of the light, the flow from the gut. Remember last night? And so I was reading this one day, and they were teaching it, and I went to David Holtz, who studied quantum physics. We were in a Pentecostal church, I'll never forget this. They told me whoever my pastor was at the time, told me I had to be an armor bearer, so I'm over there trying to, you know, he said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, that's what they told me. I gotta go hold your coat or something. And so I said, I gotta ask you a question. I said, I said it is, is the Aramaic work for prayer kind of like a dream catcher? You know, you filter the negative. And he said, Well, kind of the Aramaic picture was you had this filter and you filtered the negative thoughts and you tuned into the frequencies. That's what we did this morning. We tuned into a frequency. Yes. That's every time I listen to Gary Sigler, he tunes into a frequency. It's the frequency of love. Amen. And he said, well, yeah, kind of. And I said, well, is this kind of like sonship, 30, 60, 100 fold? He said, yeah, you, you tune into different frequencies. Most of the church world is still caught in Passover. They're still wanting to go to the old rugged cross and live there. Then you got Pentecost. That's where I grew up, you know? Man, go into a Pentecostal church and call God an it. Don't tell you and your it get out. <laughs> Tabernacles. So I started going through these different dimensions. And here's the thing that blew my mind about this Aramaic word. He looked at me and he said, you'll do Aramaic one day. I said, no. Greek's all right for you, He said, because in Greek, I started to think. And that's dangerous for church people. 
I started doing something up there. This, and I read this, and he said, that's really, Aramaic's really a holograph. I said, what's that mean? He said, you'll find that later. He said, now, quit going before you and I both get kicked out of this Pentecostal church. And he went and preached. And I never forgot what he said about holograph. Because I knew there was a connection between ancient Aramaic and quantum physics. And that leads me to this point, which I'll start whenever I speak, if I speak, even we do porch means, I don't care. We'll start with this one. You'll be able to look at the books. Let me tell you this, and I'm going to give it back to Lynn, because uh, you know, I grew up Pentecostals, and the only sin we had was buffets. <laughs> you couldn't do nothing else, but you could eat. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so as my wife was putting this together I came to her and she goes so where's your Hebrew I said well it's on a rock man you're not on there yet she said well what can we so she started looking up alphabets and so she produced this one and they're back there it has the name the meaning the picture for instance the Hebrew right here just do this it gives you, and I drew it last night, but it was a bad drawing. The alif, which is this, okay, and this drawing here, it's the ox. That's right on here. Then you have the syriac, which is this. My wife loves the, the syriac. You have the ancient Phoenician, which is that. You have the Chaldean, which is this. That's all alif. You have the ancient Brahmi, which we're still taking a lot of sources of that. And I put the Egyptian, and then I put Swar's alphabet. That was mine. And my wife put it together. We said, Hallelujah, Shandai. And she goes, I didn't like him. I said, Why? She goes, It's too. I got. So she put hers together, which has the name, the English, the ancient meaning, the Hebrew, Egyptian, Arabic, color, tone, and the Kabbalistic meaning, and its zodiac sign and its meaning in the element. So you can put these two together. I'll pass these around. We have them back there. But let me tell you, 2 o'clock in the morning, she'd start working on this stuff. And I'd drive a trash truck. I'd get tired. And I'd wake up dead sleep because I could feel the energy <laughs> when we're looking at these alphabets. It was so wild. I would be on the other side of the metro. I'd say, you're looking at them alphabets again, ain't you? I could feel this shifted the energy. I could tell you the story of Tom Flagstaff, who just, I mean, he has these dreams and he literally shakes and these lifts start coming out of him. You talk about tapping into a library. And she came to me and she said, I'm going to learn Aramaic. I said, okay, with the book. She goes, no, these languages are already within me. All I have to do is tap in. And we've been tapping in through frequency and intuition. We didn't get this out of a book. It was these vibration of these glyphs, and we start seeing them everywhere. And listen, if you understand their conceptual, this is hard to get. But if you're in an energy level, you don't understand what, exactly what I'm saying. And we would go over to the base. We'd get one chart, go to the base. We'd go one chart, go to the base. Go base. And so I finally went to him. They couldn't be here. They had some uh, pet issues. But the first thing they said is, are you going to go show Lynn and Annie? Has he ever worked about this? Because Annie and I talked about coming up with some sort of guide and system that would be an intro to Lynn to be able to listen to his CDs. And I'm not saying in any way, listen, these charts, I can't fill them all. That's why we're doing this, because I'm going to hand these charts, wherever they are, back to Lynn and let him fill in some spots. So that's what you're in. I don't care if we do it at Ports Ministry. I don't care if we do it at Golden Corral. We can do it at Starbucks. That's why I'm going to do it. I mean, I've been looking at this stuff. People be behind me going, oh, and that's what they said. I said, not that word. We can believe. We ain't going there. He said, what in the hell are y'all looking at? I said, well, that's the one thing we know. It ain't about hell. <laughs> Pass these around. We're going to give this back to Lynn. And uh, look at all these Alif. Look at these glyphs, man. This is dancing on the inside of you. You talk about the mystery of the dance. These are dancing on the inside of you. And you know what's powerful is that there's people all over the planet that know these glyphs. And we treat these people as if they're already in hell. Yeah. 
We treat these people as if they're unworthy. And the reality is, that person sitting next to you could be the key to you unlocking your next place. This is not something in the head. This is something that goes on within you. And I can feel the energy right now talking about it because this thing fills my home. We, we have these put up. Y'all, I see a car- I have them put up. Because I, I was waiting for you know, the right time, whenever that was. Come on, guys, let me tell the world that religion's crazy. And, 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 and we'd get it out just to look at it, and we'd feel the whole thing shit. And we ain't even got to the point where we're, well, we are doing Aramaic. Listen, what is so beautiful is when you chant these the way they're originally pronounced, the way Lynn does Hebrew, it shifts your whole room. Man, you should have seen me driving my trash truck four or five years ago, running around going, na pesh, na pesh. You know, and people driving by, that dude's lost his mind. Because <laughs> all they say in Texas is, howdy and go young. <laughs> Back to you, Lynn. And then I'll bring you the glyphs. Oh. Oh, my. Wow. Tell you what, because it's about 10 to 12, and there's not any way that I would even dare to want to get into uh, to, to this uh, because hmm, that don't work. That don't work. Do any women have any fingernail polish removed? They're permanent. They're permanent markers. Hallelujah. 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 You can put a non-permanent marker over the top of it and it'll clean it right off. You can do what then? Take non-permanent marker and put it right over the top of it and then clean it right off. It'll you have to write everything Just scrub it right over the top of it and it'll wipe it right off. I think it's what it's supposed to do. Take non-permanent and right over it. Yeah. Or alcohol or do it, I think. Uh, wow, okay. I, I, I hope we didn't. I guess we ruined their board. This is my little board. This is my auntie's little board. I think. A little so it's bit. not. I don't know if we can. I think a little rubbing alcohol will take it off. Honestly, uh, off any kind of. Like her saying, I'll probably do that. Like her saying, I'll do I'm an auto expert, so like her saying, I'll do a lot to you, Carly. Yeah. Make it new. In the deep, wow. the deep that's in off will do it. You know that the deep chemical that's in off. You know the spray. You know the repellent spray that does it. Um, acetone will do it. Okay, uh, WD forty will do it. Deep is amazing. Don't I do. Spray I really skin. do need this board. What? I really do need this board. But WD forty will do this it board because I, you know, this was dropped in me twenty five or thirty years ago. The picture's worth a thousand words. I can tell you this stuff and just stand here and talk to you. You can't see it. But when you can see it, I can tell, I can explain that to you, but I can draw it to you and show you how that is, and boom, you'll connect. You'll connect those dots. It's just like we have been so beat down and so deceived by religion for the last almost 2,000 years, for sure 1,700 years. We've just been so beat up by it. We are having a difficult time, even when we get in a place of anointing, like we've been in this morning, even when we get in that place, we will ricochet that anointing off ourselves onto that special one. And you are that special one. Yeah. 
And, and we will vocalize that. We will even say, He is it. He's the Son of God. And we are just doing ourselves disservice because we right. are it. Amen. Amen. He Amen. is nothing yes. but you. And if you yes. can't connect yes. to you, you can cry. You can do all you want to about what He did. And you don't get anything. That's what so burns inside me is we need to reclaim our being yes. as the yes. Son of God. That's right. Amen. Amen. And, and that's difficult. Is that just is that water? Yeah, just can't. Boy, don't touch it. What's that? Dry might be good. I don't know what are we coming back this afternoon? Yeah. Are we coming back this afternoon? Oh yeah. I can bring the chemicals that we need to clean them up. Yeah. Okay. We're going to come back at two. Okay. Let's just go ahead and uh, I wanted to explain that that set of clips, but I really do need to erase this in order to do that. If I could. Write it down below on that little space down there, Lynn. Just fill that area in, but not with the permanence. <laughs> <laughs> turn your board upside down. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, Even if you turn, do, we'll still erase it all. You can't. Uh, I'll do this just for a moment. That glib is the first glib in the Hebrew Bible. Okay. When I and when I talk about Hebrew, or when I talk about Kabbalah, I don't try not to mention Kabbalah a whole lot because the Kabbalah is a mixed bag. It's such a mixed bag and I hate that. I hate that what we've done, to, it comes back to divisions, dividing the east from the west. It's rather than, that, rather than to recognize that there's always been a unity and a cooperation, whether it's kahunas or whether it's Buddhist. Do you understand? We don't understand this. We don't understand 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 years ago they had a way to communicate with each other. We think they were primitive and that they rode a horse or they beat the hell out of their wife or did something like that and lived like cave people. Man, I tell you, they had an ability to communicate. Yes. Whether they had cell phones or they had te mental telepathy that they could communicate all the way around the world, I'm telling you, they were in touch. Yep. And we don't know that. Yep. We have been dumbed down by religion. And, you know, I, 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 I detest what religion has done to us because I know what it did to me. And I know what it does to all of us. We always project it out there rather than it's always it's in here. Yes. It, the glimpse live in here. And so you can put five points on, and I, I don't do that. I had a professor of Hebrew call me from one of the major universities here in America. I won't give his name. But he called me. He got a hold of some of my CDs. This has been a number of years back. And he said, how is it that you get that go to Vav Hay is not the Tetragrammaton? I said, I know that it's used in, in most of masonry. I know that it's used in Rosicrucian. I know that it's used in Golden Dawn. I know that it's used in most of ancient writings that yod Hey vav Hey is the Tetragrammaton. I said, but do you have your Hebrew Bible there? Do you have your Hebrew writing? You've got the Torah. And if, you, if he's an Orthodox Hebrew, and, and, and there again, we don't even know what a Hebrew is. Every one of y'all are Hebrew. I did a series on the Hebrew. Every one of you are a Hebrew. You think a Hebrew is a certain texture of hair, color of skin. That's not true. If you go to the Genesis chapter 9 and you look up Abram, the first Hebrew, Hebrew, then you begin to realize you are Abram. Yes. You are a Hebrew. You are the one, the seer, that sees as God. Because that's what Hebrew means. You are that, in that individualized deposit of God itself. And we don't recognize that. We just think I'm just an old sinner and I need to get saved by grace. We don't even know what, what Romans 10 is all about. That if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. We had not got a clue what that says in Greek. That ain't got anything to do with you saying how bad you were and begging Jesus or begging God to forgive you because you've been lowly. That's got to, got to do with you saying the same thing God said about you. And when you say the same thing God said about you, you are saying what God said. Amen. Amen. That's how you obtain wholeness. Amen. But when you begin to try to go and lay on an altar and you kneel down and cry and start everything and you say, get up, you get up the same way you went down. Amen. You did not get what you went there for. And that burns me. Right. Right. It makes me mad. I want to cuss. 
<laughs> I don't want to say bad words. Because of the deception that we've been under. Yeah. It's, it, it's a waking up time, folks. That's why this is a miraculous time to be together. This is a time that we are reclaiming our reality. No yes. one's going to leave yes. this place the way you came here. You're going to be, leave different because you're going to have a greater part of who you really are. Right. Yes. You're going to know you in a better way. That's right. You're going to know your divine essence and about your essence. This is what these glyphs are about. Yes. That is the very first glyph that starts the Hebrew alphabet. That's the very first. When he asked me, when the professor called me and asked me, he said, you said on one of your CDs that the Tetragrammaton was not yod heh vav -Hey. I said, it's not. I said, turn over there, look with me in the Torah, Exodus 3, and I'll explain it to you. I said, just read it. Read it in Hebrew too. And he did, and he paused. Silence on the phone for at least a minute. I said, are you there, doctor? Yeah. I said, what did it say? What does it say? He said, it doesn't say yod heh vav I said, that's exactly right. I am is not yod heh vav -Hey. I said, religion has made it and then give it a name and then personified it with a person. That's where we lose our oriental perception. We try to make things literal that aren't literal. They're symbolic. Why are they symbolic? They're symbolic so these glyphs trigger that energy in you and you become that. <coughs> that becomes you and a living essence of God. Yes. But, yeah, but we, yes. we haven't been able to cross right. those dots. Yes. But we are. Yes, we, we are. are. <laughs> we are. Yes. And that's what this weekend is about. That is that is unveiling of the mysteries. Yes. It's the unveiling the mystery of you and who you are. So let's go ahead and uh, that's the first glyph that starts the Hebrew Bible. That's the Beth. The Beth is the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And it means container. Everything on and in this earth realm is a ba'it or be'et, which is that, that word in Hebrew. Container. The rocks are containers. Yes. Did you not remember he said even the rocks are going to cry out? The yes. trees are containers. Aren't you like trees? Mm -hmm. yes. Everything here are containers. What are they container of? The essence of God. Life. It. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yes. And I realize it's a difficult term. I'm, I'm just like Mark. They said, you can leave. <laughs> we call it them. Essence of them. Es you know what? Anymore, Annie and I said, we think all y'all. <laughs> That's how we do it. People ask me all the time, how do I pray now? Do I say in Jesus' name or do I say God the Father? They call me all the time. And I said, pray ever how your heart leads me. If you want to go ahead and say, thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, do it without condemnation. Yes. Do it with that knowing that it's inside you. Yes. That you are yes. it and it, yes. they are you. Amen. Right. Yes. Yes. Do it that way. Yes. Um, what you just described there was my first opening up of, of knowledge on that with the Bech and the Samech. See, the yes. anti-Samechitics, yes. the Samech, if you look at the actual the, the symbol of it, They've closed off the family by closing off that open gate of the Beth. Everything's Beth Sheba, Bethlehem, everything in Beth. It comes in the open of the family. The is there, the He is there. But the Samech is actually a dirty word. And I, I, I found that, see, and the word itself is this grab, hate, protect. You've coveted. And the original coveting is actually taking the beautiful song of the Samech. Okay, it's, it's supposed to replace the Samech. The Samech, real, the real the sound is the Samech. The Ne comes before the Me. Why is it that the Nene is the grandma and the Mama is the hardest thing to teach a child? Where yet the father, the Dada, is the Zadza, is actually the father of all things. So the baby is originally not saying Dada. We have misconstrued that because Dad in Hebrew is actually uncle, which is totally messed up if you look at who the confusion is. And look at what they do. The woman's got to marry the brother of the brother of the brother. And they ask Jesus, well, who is she really married to? He says, there's no marriage in heaven. There is only love. And the Beth, what you have just described, is totally personifying everything that my original clarity, as Mark had talked about, that it is written upon our very heart before we ever knew the womb. All these symbols 
as he says, you learn from the vision. I do not get any of my knowledge from man. I have been in confirmation in the material world of everything given in the spirit of the heart. And I tell you that the confirmation is that you are absolutely 100% correct. The Beth is the first. Yes. The Beth is the very first. And what do they do? They've done, I mean, get goosebumps as I say it. The Samech is what they did. We took the bite out of the apple. They say that was the sin. No. By them putting the leg on that apple and closing it off is the perversion of all things that are knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm just going with that. That is honest. That is true. And everything that Mark was talking about, that's what I'm saying. The opium is the the vowels. The oh, eh, those are, if you look at them and get rid of all the consonants, you can start seeing the true grammatics of everything that comes that we know. Why does a baby make all the cooing sounds? That they know the vowels before the consonants. Mama comes after then. Whoa, interesting. Natural. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the the yeah. natural, the <laughs> nid. The nid, yeah. that comes before myth. And, and if we nid. go back to the, the ancient Egypt, the nectar, <coughs> Thank or you. Ra. Thank you, nectar. We, what are we going? We're going back to nature. Thank the very you. things we come over here and yes. destroyed the American Indians, we destroyed that. Thank we you. did that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Eddie and I have been to several of these ancient Indian places right here in the state of Georgia that makes me weak to think, well, I'm supposedly a Caucasian. Christian, and that's what the Christians did yes. to the people, the the netur, those who are in nature. To I mean, it's it's a disgrace, and you know how I can't go back and rewrite that, but I can apologize to it by my own life, by by no longer allowing that kind of prejudices or those kinds of things that we have done. I've got to take away this that he or she is not because he or she is this or that or the other. He or she is me. Yeah, I am they. I yeah. am. They are me. That's we right. are one. Mm -hmm. So when I put this glyph up here, this starts out. This is the foundation glyph of the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's the house. It's the temple. That's why you see Bethlehem, Beth. El, Bethana, all of the other Beth. That's why you see that because that is the temple, the house. That's what this book is about. And you've got to know the temple, the house is you. Amen. Paul said it. Corinthians, do you not know you are? And you know we don't. It, you, go, Phil. When you go. become Jesus, you can't hurt anybody anymore. Exactly. You Amen. can't condemn them you no more. And you can't hate anybody anymore. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You can't throw a stone anymore. No. You can't, yeah, you can't condemn. No. You know, when he looks out, he says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right. If we will come back to understand what sin is, it ain't got nothing to do with drinking. It ain't got nothing to do with sex. It ain't got nothing to do with any of these other things. It has to do with pain from living life. What we do to a child in the womb of its mother, what we do to a child its first seven years in its life, that's where we sin. We impart pain. We impart strife. We impart division. We impart hurt. That's what the word harmatia translated for sin. It means pain. And which Paul says, all have this pain. All have sin. It ain't got nothing to do with everybody's fallen because Adam fell. Adam didn't fall. Yes. Give him one place in Genesis 2 or 3 where Adam made a mistake. Nobody made a mistake. Amen. It ain't there. I tell preachers that. I get preacher gets some at me. I say, show me. Well, bless God, it may not be in the Bible, but this is what we believe. I say, yeah, that's your problem. What we believe has stopped us and hindered yes. us from what no. God wants us to be. And what we know I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you give it, brother. I mean, uh, it's beautiful. I'm passionate about this. <laughs> A little bit. This is the first glyph. This is the first three words. This is the Hebrew. Beth, Rash, Alif, Shin, Yod, Tol. This Beth actually means the temple, the house. Everything in the foundation of this book is poured into this Hebrew glyph. So from Genesis to the book of Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy, that's the Torah. That's the foundation of everything you have. And this is the foundation of ancient Hebrew. And the Torah, the very last word in Deuteronomy is the Hebrew word Israel. Made up of three segment, three glyphs to make one word. The glyph is, 
the, is the, the Hebrew glyph ra, which is the same word for evil, or the word for love, or the word for friend. We have a gross misunderstanding of it. And the last word, el, which is el, or alif el, which is power. And that word, the last glyph in Deuteronomy is the lamid. So when you take the lamid, the last glyph in the Torah, and you take the beth, the first glyph in the Torah, and you put them together, they spell the heart. Wow. That's what this foundation is about. It's about the heart. And when you right. get your heart in line with who you are, yes, your body Amen. will walk in yes. line and you'll find the yes. balance instead of judgment. Come on. Amen. Amen. You'll find the place where you fit yes. when you do that, as you do that. And we are doing that. That's what this is about. That's what this weekend is about, yes. is to make those adjustments. And quit fussing and fighting. People have been fussing at me fighting against me or whatever because they said, well, Ed don't believe in the literal Jesus or Lynn believes in the literal Jesus. Well, I said, it's never about that. Yes. It's about the story. It's, you, go, you go to Buddhism or go to Krishna. Yes. It's not about Krishna. It's about the story. It's about the Oriental's yes. ability to tell that story yes. and ignite the energy of God you've already yes. got. You yes. can't yes. invite yes. it there. You yes. can't ask God to come in you. God yes. lives you. Yes. Yes. That's right. yes. yes, God lives you. Even if you're like the fellow that we saw over here on the side of the road, yeah. that's that's a and my heart goes out to him. But that's his choice at this mo moment in time. If he wants to be homeless, it's his choice. My heart breaks for that. I hate to see that. You know, I give him whatever I got to give him if I can help him. I hate to see him, but you know, it's just like I can feed him, and all I got is the meal. But if I can teach him how to do it for himself, if I can break him loose. From whatever pain that's got him stuck there. And that's what's happened. He's stuck in the place. Oh, yeah. And I promise you, preaching him into hell ain't going to free him up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. No. And, I, and I don't mean that disrespectfully to all of those around him. That is not going to free him up. No. What's going to free him up is telling him the truth. Let the truth say. Amen. Yes, brother. Hey, comes by the truckload and people understand what you say. There's no hate. It's created by negative. Yeah, yes. it is. Yes. Negative energy. Yes. truckload of faith. Yes. Negative yep. energy. Okay, uh, uh, the rash, Hebrew word, ruach, that's, we, we interpret that the spirit. The Ali, ruach, poured into bed. Ali, we interpret that, the Hebrew glyph number one, God. That's what we interpret Elohim, the first glyph in that, is the Ali poured into the bed. Yeah. The Sheen, that's the breath poured into the temple. First thing it has to have when it exits, the, when the water breaks, yeah. it's all about water. When the water breaks, first thing it has to have is that yes. poured into the temple. The Yod, that's the male and the female. That's number 10. That's the the penis, and that's the womb. The male, the female. Yeah. <coughs> poured into the bath. That's 12, that's number 400, that's the last blip in the Hebrew alphabet. Time. The four, the four dimensions right there. That's what I'm going to do with that. The four dimensions. And a lot of other things I do with it. I'll put the true tetragrammata in here. And a lot of other things right there. That's what that glyph is. And you know, it's translated in the beginning. And I'm trying to rewrite that and say, no, let's start all over. Let's realize it's at your birthing. <laughs> at your birthing is your beginning. It's your incarnation. It's your time. Go ahead and be all God's made you. Be. Okay. All right. Let's just, can we move from here and do it over there? At, just one comment. All right, go ahead. Doesn't that mean that Barah is that God created the container and then filled it with Himself? Yes. yes. For instance, let me say this, since He said that, because that's what He's done. <laughs> Barah, the Hebrew Barah, which is always translated son and never should be translated son, because what if you're a woman? What if you're a daughter? Well, you don't even count. You see, if that's how you read Hebrew, 
then you don't even understand reading Hebrew because it's not referring to a son, it's referring to a child. When it says, Barishit Bara, that's the Hebrew word. Bar or Ba Ra actually means a child in time. And the child can be male or female. It doesn't matter how it takes on physical because in, up until its 50th day in the womb, it's neither male nor female. Amen. At the 50th day is when it all of a sudden, analogically and physiologically, at the 50th day, it wasn't conceived that it was a male or a female. It wasn't. But it was all of the seven endocrine glands. It was all of the seven functions of the whole man. Because number seven is perfection, completion. So that's why I use the seven stick man. That's why you, I use the seven different, uh, the golden candlestick, the rainbow, you name it. Yeah. Musical scale, da 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 da, right up through everywhere. And just, you know, on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I, you, you just totally reminded me that the, the vowels, the vowels in the, the Aramaic, um, they're the dots. And that's the yeah, see, I don't ever put the dots, and I don't, Thank simply you. because. Thank and you. I'm going to tell you why I don't do them. Because that's where you get into the creations of words that get into distraction. Yeah, but, but when we learn through meditation how to take the... You have, you have these places. In Hebrew, you have those different lingual points where breath, where this right here, this the ruach, where the wind passes through the channel of the temple makes different sounds. And if you begin to understand that, it's those sounds that just like this. But if you misuse them and you use them to spell words with it, you begin to take away from what the intent of it is. Because the intent is signs and symbols to ignite the energy that's there. It's not words. That's why I don't. I can do that. I was actually going to do that this morning. I was going to start putting some of the vowel points up here to show people, especially people who know a little about Hebrew and then they get... I mean, there's a whole plethora of schools and ideas. People ask, well, what school of Kabbalah shit. are you from? Not. Not. <laughs> Do I read up Kabbalah? I study Kabbalah. I love it. I love it. I study from a broad perspective of writers and people. A whole broad perspective. But I'm not trying to get into any school of Kabbalah, nor would I try to get into any school of masonry, whether I'm Scottish right or I'm York right, whether I'm going up the tree uh, Rosicrucian with... Uh, 12 degrees, I, I'm not getting into that because I understand those are just simple breakdowns of this phenomenal truth. Mm -hmm. And they are. But what we're doing now is, is merge it. Marry it. Let Very it all become good. one. Very good. Yeah. Let it become one. Let it become one in us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's just quit right here.